good evening everybody and welcome uh, to today's event. There's a description I think in one of the books where it's described the, there are 100 tables in a casino and there's one table which is you know you're just going to win because you know what's going to happen there. And this EGM is giving you the opportunity to get to that table at the right time and not miss that. The worst thing is to think right but not to act right in my view. And, you know, it's all very well, and I write a lot, but then sometimes I'm thinking, you know, I've got to act on this, and this is what I think you've got here, is the ability to act. It's a real privilege uh, to be uh, introducing uh, Ben. He is a renowned author, um, specializing in, in understanding individuals and businesses that have made those enormous amounts of money from very little. He was describing one fellow who started with $100,000, and is now in the billions of dollars. I saw a comment in the Business Daily about a week ago which said it's like giving uh, a drug addict a Ferrari and a shot of heroin. It can be. If that's your personality, then you've got to understand that you can't use it in that manner. But it can also be a ticket to an enormous fortune. And whether you get the, whether you take the, 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 the Ferrari and the drugs or whether you take the enormous fortune is down to you. And no one else except yourself can really tell you, one, do you have the talent? Two, do you have the emotional intelligence to be able to control how you access these markets? It's a privilege now to introduce Ben, um, author, trader. He's, he's been at the sharp end of all kinds of things. We were talking earlier about, uh, uh, about 2008 and all kinds of things. And really, somebody who's been a practitioner and has proven it. And I think there can't be anyone better to speak to us about how we're going to make our money, Ben. Yeah, <laughs> over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it's great to be back in Kenya. I was here in 1988 uh, with the British Army and uh, was based in Nanyuki. Went to Watamu, climbed Mount Kenya, went to Impala Farm, Dondol, all these places uh, that you may know. Um, I left the Army and then I went to work in the financial markets. And my first role was as a uh, working in fixed income, currencies and commodities at an American investment bank, Goldman Sachs. And Goldman Sachs, I think, was one of the most exciting places I've ever worked. The uh, energy and intelligence of the people that worked there, and actually the massive risk-taking that the, the bank took in that period. However, my uh, urge at that time was more of a military bias, and I went back to work in Angola um, in uh, a break from the Civil War, and I found out just how exciting uh, working in Angola was. It's actually terrifyingly dangerous. And after I'd spent some time in Angola, I uh, realized that um, I could achieve perhaps a similar level of adrenaline and with, a, with less risk to my life if I worked uh, back in the financial markets. And uh, so I got myself a job at Prudential Beige. Prudential Beige was really where I cut my teeth in the foreign exchange markets. And actually, the period where I worked at Prudential Beige saw a time where we converted from many currencies to the euro. That was one of the things that happened. And, uh, and some of the most exciting market moves uh, that we have seen, actually, certainly in my lifetime. So in 1998, we had Russia default on its bond portfolio, and we had some very, very extreme moves in the markets. Now, you'll be... Luckily, I, I had a 10-minute interview today with Ali, so we've discussed uh, the 1998 uh, Russia default at some length, which you can download on Twitter or, or YouTube if you, if you follow EGM markets. That wasn't why I was here today. The, the, the purpose of me being here today is to discuss the global market's outlook, from my perspective, and factors that... Um, impact foreign, foreign, trading, foreign exchange trading success and how to develop a competitive advantage. Now, I wrote a book, Currency Kings, and Currency Kings is actually 
the result of a 20-year a career in the financial market. So actually, during my time trading Forex, I worked at some big institutions with some big clients. And I cover five traders in particular who made their money trading different styles, different products, different techniques. And they all made billions. And what I wanted to drill down into is how they made their money. Okay? And what I identified was they all had a competitive advantage. So I'm going to cover competitive advantage in a moment. The other thing I discovered was that they could all scale up their competitive advantage. And that actually can be quite difficult. But in the currency markets, it is less difficult. So say you have a fantastic idea. You want to buy euros against dollars. Or actually, from what I've heard, a lot of traders in Kenya trade pounds, sterling against dollars. Okay? You can buy one pound against a dollar. You can buy 10 pounds. You can buy 100 pounds. You can buy a million pounds. You can buy 100 million pounds. If it is the same idea, the same work that's gone into that idea, then that, that is something that is scalable. Okay? I cover George Soros, who's a great example of a sterling trader, and he made $1 billion in a day in 1992 by selling sterling against the Deutsche Mark. So he's a, a, an example of a guy who actually created his own competitive advantage, and he had scale in the size of his trade. So, amongst the other traders, they all have had a competitive advantage and they all have scale. One of the other most important things that you must consider when trading is your risk management skills. Okay, it's all well and good to have a big trade and it's all fantastically good if it goes well. But actually, if it goes wrong and you're over leveraged, then you can quickly find that you have a very painful loss. So, one of the other things I cover in the book is risk management. Okay? I have a company in Monaco which specializes in risk management. So these are some of the currency kings that I cover. Top left is George Soros. <clears throat> We've probably all heard of George Soros. The second one with a big cigar in his mouth is a guy called John Henry. Has anybody heard of John Henry here? Has anyone, does anyone support Liverpool Football Club here? Yeah. Yes? Does, any, <laughs> does anyone, okay, so I'm leading you to the answer of the question. Do you know who owns Liverpool Football Club? John Henry. Okay, so John Henry is an inspiration to me personally because I dealt with John Henry on many occasions and he did massive amounts of foreign exchange through Prudential Beige also through Merrill Lynch, who actually, as a CTA, um, they put money with him to manage. And he had phenomenal successes over a period of about 20 years. So actually, he started with capital of just $100,000. Okay? And he made billions. Okay? And he had compound returns, probably for a 20-year period, of 30%. How did he do this? He held on to a trend. He tenaciously held on to a trend. And actually, his competitive advantage in what he describes was quite a simple one. He, he back-tested markets for many, many years. He discovered that markets trade in trends. Okay? And he worked out a systematic system that could trade the trend for the long term. So he wasn't in and out of the markets. He just held on and held on. And he levered up when he had a a good profit, and he cut down when he started to lose money. Okay, But he made fantastic returns. The third man with a cigarette in his hand is a guy called Jim Simons. Jim Simons used to run a company called Renaissance Technologies. Renaissance Technologies is one of the biggest hedge funds ever, and Simons is credited with making 30 to 40 percent compound for a period of 40, 30 years. Simons is a math professor. Okay, he hired a bunch of quants. He, he, he hired clever graduates in computer science, physics, mathematics, aeronautical engineering, rocket science. He cobbled them all together 
in a place, and they look for patterns amongst patterns, little nuances in the markets where they can make money. Okay? But he made a lot of money trading arbitrage. Okay? And I also made money trading arbitrage. I'll tell you this story a bit later. When I, when I was in Dubai, I actually had a competitive advantage. He has a competitive advantage. The guy here with the glasses, we'll cover him a bit later, Ursh uh, Schwarzenbach, a big options trader. He discovered that when the options were at the beginning, in the 70s, that he could sell short-term options, because options benefit, if you sell them, from time decay. And volatility, uh, implied volatility, is normally higher than historical volatility. And you have these fat tails that create a volatility smile. So he could make money out of volatility in time. These other guys in the bottom corner are online trading entrepreneurs. The guy top left created a very scalable trading platform. The platform is MT4, which is the platform that EGM securities use. So we're coming on to strategy. Okay, If you're going to trade currencies, you need a strategy. It's called doing the work. And I figured out that these are the strategies that most people employ nowadays. So global macro, in my opinion, is where we should be focusing today. Okay? And I think there are reasons, which I'll come on to a bit later in the talk, why global macro will present us with some trading opportunities. At the end of my discussion, I will have a hypothesis of what I think are driving the markets and what trades that potentially we can take on the back of that hypothesis. A lot of people follow technical analysis. Are there any technical analysis people here? People use charts to trade. I know Calvin does. Where is it? Where are you? There. There's more than one. Okay. So technical analysis is very useful for some people. It was useful for John Henry. Okay. It was useful for him to get into his trades. Some people use a combination of global macro and technical. Okay. You find that a lot in the financial markets. Hey, maybe, Ali, uh, from your experience, you have guys uh, on the prop desk that say, oh, I think I should be buying this, that, or the other. And they say, well, I, let me look where the support and resistance is. That's, that's fair to say. Okay? We used it a lot in, in the banks and brokerages that I worked for. And a lot of people find that quite helpful. Carry trading, something for Kenya. Your interest rate, I believe, is about 9%. Okay? So if you hold on to, in my mind, if I could hold on to Kenyan shillings that pay me 9% and I sell dollars that, that, that cost me 2% then theoretically I make 7%. There's a lot of carry trading that goes on in Dubai and in India. Okay, people hold the currency, they aim to make the carry, the positive carry. Scalping is short-term trading looking for short-term profits. Arbitrage it's where I had a competitive advantage. I made money every day for three and a half years in Dubai by arbitraging a non-deliverable forward market against a futures exchange. Okay? That, my competitive advantage was that I had great pricing from the banks and my company had some capital to support my trading. Options, I've mentioned volatility and time. If you write options, then potentially you can make money. But beware if you write options, you have risks if they go the wrong way and your losses can be unlimited. And finally, I think it's important in this day and age, diversification can help you greatly if you diverse across, diversify across strategies and products. And I think that's probably the reason that EGM has invited people here today. They have equities, and foreign exchange. And foreign exchange is an asset class of its own and a diversification against other asset classes. Anyone here feeling lucky? Is anyone lucky here? Anyone? Who's lucky? One, two, three. Okay. Four, five. Anyone unlucky here? Okay. Right, did you know that uh, luck plays a great part in trading success? Now, I hope that we're all humble enough to accept that. 
because I'm going to give you a few examples that explain luck. Now, there's been a couple of surveys and a book written on this. Um, very often, the most successful people are moderately talented, but very lucky. Does that hold true with anybody here? Yeah. This guy, Alessandro Pluccino, is the co-author of Talent Versus Luck, The Role of Randomness in Success and Failure. How many times have you had a trade where you've lost money only for it to go your way after you've got out of the trade? Yeah, that's, uh, that happened a lot when I was at Prudential Beige. I used to have a trader, he traded the dollar mark in those days. And every time he got a trade wrong, he would throw his pen down and wonder why he was so unlucky. And as soon as he got out of his trade, it would go absolutely his way. Every single time. Okay. So the book, at the bottom there, there's a book, Fooled by Randomness, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. It's one of the best books I've read. And actually, Nassim Nicholas Taleb explains that he feels that 99.9% .9 of all trading outcomes are down to luck, good or bad. Think about that one. So be lucky. Right, so here, here's an example. This is a totally 50-50 bet. This you could consider being a toss of a coin, but we'll call it traders who are lucky and traders who are unlucky. And um, after a period, we say that we cut out the losers and we stick with the winners. Okay, so if we have a cohort of 10,000 managers or traders, after one year, you have 5,000 lucky ones that are left, just on the, the basis of a 50-50 coin flip. After two years, there's 2,500 left, and after three years, there's 1,250 left. That is roughly 12.5% 12 12 of the original cohort. So those traders could actually say, I'm a great trader, but actually, you can explain their trading by luck. Now we take a cohort of bad traders. Okay, they have a, the odds of winning a 45% and of losing a 55%. So the expected return is negative for this group of traders. You can see that after three years, 9% of the bad traders are still alive and could explain that they are great traders, but we know that they're already a bad bunch of traders. In the retail market, we have, according to certain statistics, only a 20% chance of winning. Okay? One of the reasons I wrote my book is to try and lift that uh, statistic. I want retail traders to, to win more often. I want to raise that to 40%. Okay? And if I achieve that, that will be a, a huge result. Okay? But the reason retail traders lose money is that they tend to over leverage and they tend to over trade. Okay? As professional people, I would expect that you would not over leverage and not over trade. But be aware that these are, these are the reasons that most people lose money. Even out of this cohort of bad traders or unlucky traders, after three years, 80 of them would survive and think that they're really, really good traders. It can be explained away by luck. I wanted to show you some examples of institutional blow-ups. Okay? I've worked and I've seen this happen in real time. Okay? And every year there seems to be some kind of a blow up in the financial markets. And you would think that the institution or the institutional traders have the edge. They have a competitive advantage. They have the economics team, they have the compliance team, they have the risk team, they have the brilliant minds. But every year there's one kind of a blow up or another. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Société Générale, 2008. Now, what's um, slightly amusing about this story is there was a young trader. His name is Jerome Curville. And Jerome Curville is a f young French man, and uh, he managed to lose 
billion euros. Okay, and nobody in his company knew about it. Uh, and what I find slightly surprising is that if he had made 7.1 billion euros, I think all his bosses would have received the biggest bonuses that they had ever received because they would all have known about that trade. There are big blow-ups in big companies every year. UBS is another good example. 2012, 2.3 billion rogue trader. But every year, um, Armanaf advisors, these guys in Canada, they lost $6.6 .6 billion in national, uh, na natural gas derivatives. There will be another blow up. Who knows when, but someone is going to blow up. And we're all going to read about him. The reason they blow up is they take too much risk, they're not monitored correctly, and they're over leverage. Leverage. I shall discuss that relatively quickly. So the platform MT4 is what EGM securities use. And for a period of time, there was a competition with uh, robots, actually, robotic uh, algorithmic trading signal providers. And the idea was to make as much money as possible to win a prize. So these people could over leverage and over trade. The results are staggering. 2006, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12. Out of 2,726 fantastic designed systems, only 21% money, 21% made money over that time scale. The reasons being they were over leveraged not, necessar not, not necessarily over-trading, but definitely over-leveraged. There are some statistics which tell you that the less leverage you take, the better you are likely to perform. Now, I think that is uh, a reasonable assumption. If you have 25 times leverage, then you need a 4% need a loss to wipe out. If you have 5% leverage, if the market moves 20% against you, then you would wipe out. So less leverage, more success. And this is an FXCM statistic across its client base. And it said the win ratio for people who traded with less leverage was significantly better. Similarly, for larger accounts, slightly more professional accounts, institutional accounts. But basically, the, the, the point here is that larger accounts tend to perform better. Why is that? Because probably they take less leverage, and probably they've got more skin in the game. Okay? If you have a million dollars, you don't really want to be going all in every time you trade. You trade a little bit more sensibly. If you have a smaller account, then maybe it doesn't matter if you lose a little bit of money. Okay? So the more professional trader you are, the bigger the account, the less leverage you take, the better chance you have of winning. Frequency of trading. Unless you have a high frequency trading account, which nicks nickels and dimes all the time, you are going to suffer if you over trade. So I've given a chart here. On a minimal commission, if you over trade, your cost can be significant. So we have a, an account with $10,000. It's only 0.1 of a pip. So if you're trading sterling, the spread would be 0.1 on top of the, the bid ask spread, with the commission here. If you trade 200 times leverage, so let's take a sensible amount of leverage, five times. At the end of 500 trades, you would pay $250 away. But if you traded on crazy amounts of leverage to 200, after 500 trades, you've actually paid away your initial margin in spread. And a lot of people get really into trading frequently. If you are a person who may have this habit, 
then buying options is probably a way that you can avoid overtrading. You have a position, you pay your premium, you follow your, your option, but then you're, you have the position, but you're not in and out of the markets. So trading with frequency is, is for scalpers, and it's also for people who have a competitive advantage in terms of what they can make every time they trade. So high-frequency traders is a good example. Risk management. If you don't have risk management, then you shouldn't trade. Okay, it's as simple as that. There have been so many examples of blow-ups in my financial markets career that risk management is a must. And any professional trader knows this. There are four things that kill most traders. Okay, the first one is overconfidence. And this, I feel, is probably what's going on in America right now. We have successive record highs in the NASDAQ and the S&P. Even in Japan, actually, today, the Nikkei hit a 27-year high. Okay, so there's a lot of confidence in equities. So if you have confident people, people just invest because the market's going up. They don't really know why. And actually, Ali, uh, to bring him back into the spotlight, I was watching one of the EGM videos that, that you do, and it's possibly with Calvin, I'm not so sure, but you were talking about the NASDAQ, and it was a day when the NASDAQ had touched a record high. And uh, you made the very, very sensible point that uh, if you go back to 2001, you had a NASDAQ that went to 5,200 before it came down to anyone like to hazard a guess where the NASDAQ came down to in 2001, from 5,200 high. Anyone? 2,000? Nope. The answer is... 1,200, I think, was the was the, the low. So it had an 80% correction. Okay, so you had a bunch of people that were all in on internet stocks. So it's called the in, the dot com bubble. FX was actually pretty quiet during that period because people were buying and buying Nasdaq. FX became more popular when people were selling Nasdaq. Okay, because they lost 80% of the value in that index. Okay, so think of FX as a hedge, an alternative investment to stocks. Overconfidence, I believe, is one of the aspects of the market at the moment that hasn't been factored in. And you can see this when you look at the S&P VIX, which is the volatility index, and other metrics around the risk in the markets. People aren't pricing in risk. Optimism leads to biases, okay? One of those biases is herding, and I think we see that right now in, in the way that these markets are, are going up. Herding can happen rather more rapidly in the other sense. When markets start to correct, you can have a herding sensation where people very quickly offload risk. So if people are overconfident, they tend to overleverage and they tend to overtrade. And they, there's a habit called um, overriding. So if you have, are sensible and you have risk management, then you will, you will respect your risk limits. If you override your risk limits, it's because you are an, either an optimist or you suffer from another human frailty, which is that you're prepared to take bigger losses than the gains that you make. And this is actually a, a theory propounded by Daniel Kahneman. It's called prospect theory. So people actually will hold on to the pain of a loss far longer than they will enjoy a win. Okay? It's inherent. It's a human frailty, and it shouldn't be taken in the financial markets, but it does happen. Okay? If you have all these problems, then you're going to wipe out, and then that's the end of the game, so stop trading. So what is missing? Discipline and risk management. It's a must-have. 
This is the bit that I'm most excited about. It's competitive advantage and how to, to try and get one. I'm going to cover briefly four of the traders that had a competitive advantage. But first of all, we have a look at, the, about, look at um, this guy. Now this guy's a gambler. His name is Bill Benter. And um, it's a fantastic story. Has anyone been to Hong Kong? Yeah, no? Yes, you have. Okay, so in Hong Kong you have these horse races every Wednesday, every Saturday. And the Hong Kong Chinese are very, very big gamblers on horse racing. And there's, a, there's a, an event in the middle of the horse racing called the Triple Trio. You have three, three races. You have to guess the one, two, three in the three races. Okay, so you actually have the odds. Bill Benter was a statistician. He knew his odds. He worked out which were the duff horses, which were the, the dodgy uh, trainers, the jockeys who might throw, a, throw an event, the ones that were in there to, de to, to distort the picture. And he took on the Hong Kong gambling authority or the people that owned the horse racing franchise and he beat it. And he beat it regularly. Okay? But in one event, he won the triple trio. Okay? And he won 118 million Hong Kong dollars. And because he didn't want to let them know that he'd cracked the system, he had to give it all away to charity. All right? So, good guy. He went on to make billions because once he'd cracked the code, he did it again and again. The currency kings. George Soros, reflexivity is his competitive advantage. And I believe that we have examples of reflexive processes in the markets right now. Okay, to, to explain this in the simplest way possible, Soros says there's a prevailing bias in the market. That bias right now in US stocks is a prevailing buying bias. People are buying. Okay? And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that fits into the fundamentals. And it keeps on escalating and escalating until there is a shock in the system that changes the prevailing bias. If you can think of a product life cycle in marketing, that might give you the idea. Okay, so buy early adapters, gets mature, and then it comes off. So this is his theory of reflexivity. He's made billions and billions of dollars. I think his net worth is about $37 billion right now. And he's given tens of billions to charity or to set up uh, organizations in countries to promote open societies. John Henry, I mentioned him before, created a long-term trend following strategy, held it until the end. The trend is your friend until it bends at the end. Okay? That's true. Uh, Ursh uh, Schwarzenbach, I mentioned him earlier. So if you have a look at the two charts, the first chart is a, a description of what's called the volatility smile. And you see that volatility increases the more out of the money an option is. And Schwarzenbach used this to, to trade a, an option strangle and straddle strategy. He also benefited from time decay. Now when I met um, uh, Schwarzenbach, I met him in St. Moritz in Switzerland. He said at the very beginning of trading options, he would trade options, he would sell options very short term because you had this massive time decay, very short term. As the banks got into the trading, he had to trade more longer term. And actually there's real risk when the markets move rapidly because volatility is uh, skewed. If you look at a, a normal distribution of um, prices, you have something called skew, and, or fat tails. Okay? And if the markets become a bit more volatile, the skew increases and the tails get fatter. Okay? And this is what increases the price of volatility. And it can be very painful if you're short options. Jim Simons, I covered him. Arbitrage. Now, I'll give you an example of arbitrage. I was based in Dubai, and I mentioned it before. I had this competitive advantage where I could buy and sell on two different markets. Buy Indian rupee and sell Indian rupee on and off exchange. Now I had good pricing for my banks. I had great relationships with my banks and I had capital. And I effectively could 
trade and arbitrage, it was in Indian rupee, Malaysian ringgit, Indonesian rupee, South Korean won, all day long, and make money. And I made money, and I could go to bed with a flat book. I uh, didn't have any risk overnight. But we developed a competitive advantage. We couldn't scale it to make billions. We could make small millions, but not billions. These guys created online brokerages. They profited when other people lost. Okay? In some brokerages, they run something that's called a B-book. The B-book is where you have a lot of small traders, you take the opposite side to their trades. Nowadays, brokers trade with a straight-through process, i.e. your trade goes through agency process through to the banks. So they're not running the other side of your trades. These guys in the early days did exactly that. So why do we need a competitive advantage? Because of these reasons. Right? The first thing is you're taking on the market. So there was a, anyone heard of long-term capital management? Yes? Long-term capital management had two Nobel Prize winners in options pricing. They took prop traders from Solomon Brothers, from Goldman Sachs. They took the best of the best traders and they made millions of dollars for about three years. But then the market discovered what they were doing, which was an arbitrage on some bonds. And when the market found out what they were doing, they pushed the arbitrage away from LTCM so that the trade didn't converge when they wished it to. And this was a market anomaly in terms of their explanation, but actually this company wiped out. It wiped out so badly that the Fed had to reduce interest rates to stabilize the markets. These are some of the smartest people that ever traded on Wall Street, and they blew up a massive hedge fund by over-leveraging and taking too much risk. So the market is bigger than the individual also. I may have a great idea, but any one of you may have a better idea. I may have a big position, but you may have a bigger position. You will never know who is on the other side of the market, because the market is enormous. The market is not a game. Bill Benter, the guy from Hong Kong Races, he traded a game. He knew the size of his market, he knew the total pool, he knew the odds of winning. You do not know the odds of winning in the FX markets because the markets are so vast. The market is unfair, it's unfair to everybody, especially if you do not respect your risk management. And as I mentioned before, human emotions and behavior can disastrously affect trading performance. One last competitive advantage. Can anyone think of it? Because we, I think actually in Kenya, most people have this competitive advantage. Anyone? Is anybody happy here? Anyone? Who's happy? There you are, the happiness advantage. Okay. If you don't have a true competitive advantage in the markets, be happy and be lucky, okay? Because happiness, unbelievably, has been quantified as making you more successful. The global market outlook. My hypothesis, and I feel this quite strongly, is that there are six drivers in the financial markets at the moment. Okay, the first one is excess liquidity. So since 2008, you've had a lot of central banks pumping in cash to the markets. Okay, this has made people very overconfident. In, in actual fact, it's made a lot of people very greedy. I think computer algorithms distort financial markets. I think the US is unequivocally driving the financial markets at the moment. 
I think there are certain geopolitical risks that also seem to be stemming from one person who resides in a white building in America, in Washington. And I think one of the drivers of the markets currently is Brexit. And I believe that you can use these to make some sensible trading decisions. Okay, because if we have this excess uh, liquidity and risk taking, we have an underpricing of risk, which I've mentioned, and it excess greed leads to excessive risk taking. Okay, there are many, many bubbles. Who can who can give me an example of a bubble right now? Someone from the back, can you? Are there any bubbles that you can think of in any market whatsoever? No? Anyone over there? Anyone want to have a stab at a market bubble? Yes, sir. Sorry? I can't hear, sorry. Stocks, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Pot stocks. Okay. What about property? Property in Hong Kong, Vancouver, even Frankfurt has a property bubble. London. What about fine wine? Vintage cars? Handbags? <laughs> okay, there, there are many bubbles. Okay. Market manipulation. Now, the, we've seen actually frequently over the last couple of years traders that are being called to court for manipulating markets. Now, when I worked on the F FX desk in the past, we had a, an element of our desk that was called flow trading. So flow trading is that you have a big order that comes in from a big trader, and you, after you've executed that order, you, um, you may follow that guy. You follow the flow. But actually, this has been abused by a lot of traders who would see that there was a big order, and they would trade in front of that order. It's called front running. Execute the order for the, the trader, and then get out of their own position. It happens a lot. And there have been some several high level cases brought in New York against currency cartels from senior banks, tend to be the same banks. Um, HSBC was an example of one where traders got caught out, Barclays is another. So there's been manipula manipulation in several markets, and it's not just currencies, it's LIBOR, it's gold, even equities are manipulated. They're manipulated by uh, computer algorithms in my opinion. If you uh, have heard of a company called Charles Schwab, it offloads the bulk of its equity trades to Citadel Securities, who make markets. Okay? Citadel Securities runs a high-frequency algorithm that takes little bits of commission out of these trades. Okay? So be prepared. There's market manipulation by humans and computers, less so by humans nowadays because they're all going to jail, but computers nevertheless. And actually, over the last three years, I've identified several anomalies in, in currency markets. So the first one actually, go back to January 2015, the Swiss franc. Does anyone remember the event of January 2015? Okay, the Swiss franc uh, was supported by the Swiss National Bank. Sorry, the, the euro was supported by the Swiss National Bank. And they held a peg at 1.2 Swiss francs to the euro. And they defended that peg with utmost determination. And they kept, you know, in their meetings, we will defend this peg with utmost determination until the day that they stopped defending the peg. And the Swiss franc collapsed. It didn't just collapse, it, it, it was like a bomb went off. The Swiss franc strengthened from 1.2 to 0.65 in about three and a half minutes. And it took everything out in between. It wiped out many brokerages. Deutsche Bank had losses of $150 million. Saxo Bank, probably $150 million. Citibank, $150 million. FXCM, which was a retail brokerage, wiped out, got bailed out by Lucadia. Alpari was another broker. Finished. Okay. So this all happened on the back of market manipulation by computer algorithms. There was no liquidity when the market needed it. There are examples in sterling, New Zealand dollar, South African rand. Silver had a, a dump and pump the other day. It dropped probably 7% in a matter of minutes. 
rallied back up again. All to do with computers. Okay, the Dow Jones. February of this year. Dropped 1,600 points in about 15 minutes. Why did that happen? So US interest rates, no, not US interest rates. The 10-year bond yield crept above 3%. That was the trigger and the liquidity evaporated. Beware for the dangers of computers and algorithms. So here's an example of excessive risk taking. Can we all see this chart? Another bubble, sorry, the gentleman there said pot. What's the other obvious bubble which probably popped in December of last year? Who's got it? Bitcoin, well done. Like I say, Bitcoin reached 20,000, give or take, in December of last year. So <clears throat> this stock listed in New York. When I was in Dubai, the owner of this company came to see me and he was a high frequency trader. And he traded lots of markets, Singapore exchange, traded spot currencies, made money. He said, I'm gonna go public. I wanna get some cash into my company. So great. A few months later, he sent me a prospectus for the company that he was gonna list and offered me a part of that company. I said, no, thank you. My wife had spent my money on property, so I didn't have an investment to put into it. And then he listed his company. Two days after he listed his company, or IPO, he, he announced that he had some blockchain technology and his stock rocketed from $5 a share to $140 a share. And this company was worth $10 billion. And it only made very small millions in profits. Two days later, he went on to CNBC and said, well, actually, the blockchain technology is in beta testing. And the stock came down. Okay, this guy is in big trouble. He's got lots of class actions against him. The stock, I think, is trading around 5 or $6 again. This is an example of excessive risk-taking and greed. This uh, chart is, um, or this matrix, is just to um, illustrate that if you have rising interest rates, there tend to be corrections in equity markets. Mr. Trump, I mentioned, um, do I have to say very much about Mr. Trump? <laughs> okay, I'm not so sure I do. Now, there are some risks in the market to do with Mr. Trump. And I think one of the main ones is that he kind of causes a lot of, he's politically incorrect, shall we say. Um, so geopolitical issues, definitely doesn't get on with the Canadian prime minister. He's upset Mexico, probably upset the European leaders, upset Kim Jong-un till he made friends with him, upset Vladimir Putin till he made friends with him too. Um, but his, his biggest ri risk is impeachment. Okay? But before that could ever happen, and I don't think impeachment will happen, the US has something called midterm elections in November. Okay? And there's a very real risk that the Democrats, the opposition to Mr. Trump, will win the House. And that will make his politics more difficult to implement. Okay? The other risk, I think, to the markets. October is always a traditionally rocky month in, in my lifetime. There have been some, some huge crashes in October. Volatility you know, is, is potentially increasing in, in October. So the midterms happen in November. I would urge some caution trading US equities from now until after the midterms. Okay, now Mr. Trump does impose sanctions on various countries, whether it's Iran or Turkey, and he imposes tariffs on other countries, such as China. And probably, if he doesn't get his way, Canada. Okay, so I, I think there's potential opportunities from a global macro perspective, purely by, by trying to read what Mr. Trump says and does. 
Do we know who this lady is? Yeah. Poor Mrs. May. So David Cameron gave her the job, right? And she's got to deal with Brexit. She's got hassle from all sides. You know, whether it's from the Conservative Party trying to oust her as a leader, to fighting with the Brexit leaders or the European Council in um, Salzburg last week. You know, one day we hear that Brexit's going to be happening and there's, there's some kind of agreement. The next day it's not happening. So the pound oscillates on the back of news about Brexit. A no deal potentially is a bad deal for the UK. Some kind of Brexit agreement is positive for the UK. So you can take your choice on how you trade the pound, if you wish to trade the pound. And if you think nothing is going to happen until March 29th, six months' time, then you can trade the range. Okay, it's possible to trade sterling. It's been quite range-bound for several, several weeks. You saw last week, actually, on good uh, UK data that the pound rallied. But on the back of uh, problems with the, the European Council, it collapsed back where it was. Now, the other thing you need to consider is that the US is raising interest rates, so that could be detrimental to a pound from an interest rate perspective. Okay, so my personal feeling is that I don't really, I'm not very confident in the pound, and I prefer the euro as a currency against the pound. So bearing in mind those are my premises, what are my trading ideas on the back of those? Okay, I have eight that I'm going to share with you. So I believe that the US will get its way with Canada, and I don't think that's a great deal for Canada. I also think that because the US is raising interest rates, um, and there's a Canadian potential for a housing bubble, should it raise its interest rates, that longer term, the Canadian dollar should be potentially weaker. Now, this could be offset by higher oil prices. I prefer euros to sterling on the Brexit. And actually, trade number three, I'm not very convinced about this trade. I see the yen has weakened somewhat significantly over the last few weeks. The Nikkei has uh, touched record highs again today. But actually, if there is some kind of flight to quality, if there's a correction in the market, then yen is a currency that generally benefits. Now, as the interest rate carry dollar yen is probably 2% at the moment, if there's a correction in the US, people will take their money out of Japan. And you could see this correction where they buy yen. US equity indices, I think they're all overvalued, personally. Gold. I touched upon it this morning. Gold is generally a hedge against uncertainty. And it's also a hedge against risk. And my feeling is that risk is underpriced in the markets currently. Um, short, certain, excessively overvalued US stocks with weak balance sheets, zero profits, and no competitive advantage. That's a mouthful. Okay, who follows Tesla here? Anyone? <laughs> From today you do, anyway. Okay, well, I've been following a few stocks in America which I tend not to like. One of those stocks is a stock called Snapchat. Does anyone use Snapchat? Okay, this company IPO'd at $30 billion, right? I've never known why people would pay $30 billion for a company that has a disappearing photograph. Okay. Snapchat suffered when one of its competitors created a product that has a disappearing photograph. Okay. Snapchat's under pre or Snap is under pressure right now, um, along with other stocks. doesn't make any money, actually, Snap. Okay. So Tesla is another good example. So Tesla has a, a CEO that some might call a maverick. His name is Elon Musk. And he's a, a little bit handy with Twitter. Okay, so a few weeks ago, he tweeted that uh, he had secured funding to take his company private. And the target price was $420. And uh, the stock obviously ramped up, squeezed out short people who were very upset. And then he retracted his comments, and the stock uh, came down. Now, last night, he was, he's been taken to court by the SEC. 
in America for fraud, right? And uh, Tesla dropped 12% out of hours, okay? It opened lower today, 12%. So there are other stocks, Facebook, Twitter, could be vulnerable. They've been in to see the Senate committees, and they've been interviewed about their practices and uh, the data protection for, for their clients. Other stocks such as maybe Fitbit, I've, I've had a look at Fitbit, created a watch where you can see how many steps you walk every day. Does it have another product that can continue to keep its stock price buoyant? So, so the few stocks that potentially are vulnerable if there's some kind of correction. Back to currencies, Australia. I've been focusing on Australia recently and I like what I see in terms of growth in Australia. And I like it relative to Canada. Both these current countries have the same interest rate, roughly one and a half percent. Okay, so there's no interest rate carry. So that is a pure trade on which country will raise its interest rates first. I believe it will be Australia. And lastly, you could, you could apply this to Kenya, but I like, actually, I prefer Indian rupee as a trade because I know it better. Now, Indian rupee touched record lows the other day, and the government is doing something to try and protect the rupee, to strengthen the rupee, and that's not just raising interest rates. It is uh, imposing import tariffs. And I believe that the rupee will strengthen over time. A little bit about winning. So my contention is that anybody here can be a successful trader. Now that's whether you have a competitive advantage or actually in other cases whether you're happy and lucky. Okay. But a genuine competitive advantage is what's going to make you successful. And if you can scale up that competitive advantage, then you can make a fortune. Okay? Luck will definitely play a part in the success or failure of individuals and managers. But if we don't have a competitive advantage, then we've got to think a little bit outside of the box. And that, in my mind, involves diversification. Okay, any portfolio manager will tell you that you should be diversified across asset classes. Okay. So, if you want to win, you've got to think about winning is a good start. Okay? And that's actually a question of focusing your mind. Okay. Anybody here is capable, I think you all are actually already, capable of trading intelligently. But we mustn't confuse our abilities with luck. Now, I've actually, I have been lucky enough to analyze my successes and failures. And I was explaining once again to Ali today that I had a period where I was a prop trader um, for a large institution, and I used to take very, very big positions, and I found it very difficult to, to manage the stress of running significantly large positions and the risk that it entailed. And it was only when I developed my competitive advantage that I realized that for all those years as a speculator, I was just guessing, intellectually guessing the direction of the market. That is actually what speculators do. So taking a view on the back of thorough analysis. But actually I could, like, like, like the trader at Prudential Beige, some days I would have a fantastic trade where I'd lose money. Other days I couldn't explain why I made money. So when I had a competitive advantage, I understood that I was winning and why. And that is what people are trying to search for in the markets until they find it. If you don't have a competitive advantage, I think it's sensible to diversify. And the other thing is to keep leverage low and to consider what you want to risk before you trade. Why you want to trade. Is it for extra income? Is it, to, is it for your pension? 
Is it for a career? What is the purpose of why you want to trade? And what are you prepared to lose in pursuit of your trading? And how badly is it going to stress you out by trying to achieve your objectives? So the other thing is that we must look at ourselves and constantly try and analyze whether we have a competitive advantage and what is our add value? What is our add value in trading? And if you want to self-trade, you need to have a reliable partner. Okay? This is why you have been invited here, I believe, tonight, because EGM is a reliable partner in Kenya. Okay? And EGM has the products for you to diversify. It has the capability to help you. It has a program of educating smaller traders. But in terms of larger traders, the service is much more bespoke and tailored to your needs. I think it's always useful to be aware of your weaknesses because then you can be also aware of your strengths. Okay? And if you are successful, then make sure you don't tell everybody about it. Because once the market knows, then they'll take you out. It'll take you out. So the, here's some great books. I think you should particularly focus on the one in the middle. Um, oh, no, sorry. So there are five great books that I, I think are well worth a read. And they're all about different things. So Thinking Fast and Slow is by Daniel Kahneman. It's a great book. It discusses prospect theory. It discusses, discusses human behavioral failings. Okay? It's well worth a read. You will understand your weaknesses if you read that book. Fooled by Randomness is a book about chance. It explains luck. It explains the big trader that worked for the big investment bank that made a fortune for three years in a row. And he was the biggest guy and everyone respected and revered him. But then, a year later, he got fired for taking enormous risks and losing the lot. Okay? It explains randomness and luck in the financial markets. My book is about winning, it's about competitive advantage, it's about scale, and it's about risk management. I think it's a must-read for smaller traders, novice traders, and actually even professional traders. A lot of people who are in the professional fraternity have contacted me and said that they enjoyed what they read. Mastering Uncertainty in Commodities Markets is written by a friend of mine. He's in Monaco. He created a technical trading system, a long-term technical trading system over several years, and he really, really worked hard with PhDs help building his system. He's a very humble guy. It is an excellent book about those who wish to create a system of trading. And then lastly, Market Wizards. It's an old book. It's by Jack Schwager, and it recounts histories of successful traders, principally in a period where there were some decent trends in the market. Okay, it's a book from the, I think, late 80s to the 90s. But it's a very good read. It's also about risk management. It's about trading style. It's about philosophy. So those books, I think, are well worth a read. Okay, going back to the reputable broker scenario, I think we should diversify markets. <clears throat> I think it's very sensible to trade equities, bonds, indices, Commodities, precious metals, more so nowadays, currencies, and actually crypto, I, I, I'm not so confident about in general, but if you can find some kind of an arbitrage in crypto, it may be interesting for you. Allocate capital to managers or styles that involve some of the following. Frankly, right now, I think global macro is the way forward. Okay, but long-term trend following, does make money. I had a couple of managers that I was working with. One had a breakout strategy, so he was looking for currencies that broke out of certain ranges, and one manager had a break-in strategy, so different currencies, different products. But diversified, the risk was kind of hedged. And then a carry strategy to earn interest rate carry. Diversified products, spot FX, futures, forwards, options if you can get hold of them. 
Okay, if you want to follow me or EGM Securities, um, the addresses are there, Twitter at EGM Securities, EGM underscore Securities, uh, me, my, I'm actually at TradeFXSmart, Facebook, EGM Securities, YouTube, EGM Securities, and also I have a mini tutorials on, on technical analysis if you want to watch those. And Amazon.com is where you can find my book amongst other places. Okay, that's it for me. For, uh, are there any questions? <laughs>